So we will hear about the Onweisung, about, about the, about the, um, the Onweisung and the Beispiel, the example and the instructions of the Rebbets and from two very special individuals. One of them is my great privilege, pleasure, and honor to call upon one of the great chassidim of our generation, well known, and I also have the privilege of calling him uncle, and, um, and therefore I've learned much from my uncle, so sein gesund und stark. He's a shliach in Great Britain, London, England, leads the girls' school there, and many other shlichasen through the years. So without further ado, I would like to call upon Rabbi Shmuel Lu, Zosan Gesund, to share with us from his relationship with the Rebetzin, with stories, lessons, etc. L'chaim, Rabbi Lu. Chaim, Chaim. Yeah. You know, right after Chov Bey Shvat, 36 years ago, I heard a vote from Rabbi Yossel Weinberg. And by Yisroi. My Yishma Yisra and Yisra came with Tzipora. And he said that there's a medrash. That there was the Giluyim. The Giluyim of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. And especially the Giluyim of Kiryas Yamsuf. And Tzipora missed it. She didn't see it. She wasn't there. And she wasn't there so that Moshe Rabbeinu should be able to do whatever he had to do in the way that he wanted to do it and in order to lead Kalal Yisrael to the Geula. And the schar is that when Mashiach comes and there'll be Shira and there'll be Tatetzana Anoshim again, that Tzipar will be right in the front, be the first one. And that's a, a, a perfect analogy, as we heard just before from the Mendel fella, Mazel Tov, by the way, and um, all the stories about the Rebbe, all night, all day, that there was a person there who wasn't present physically in order that the Rebbe should be there for Klal Yisrael, and on the other hand, she was always there when the Rebbe came in. She said that a man darf nicht daheim kommen to a to a lady gestu. She said that uh, somebody asked her, "Why do you why do you always awake when the Rebbe comes home? Whatever, if it could be two in the morning, it could be five in the morning." And she said, "A person should not come home to an empty house." It, it, that was the extent. And uh, he told stories like this from Mrs. Sternberg. <clears throat> I heard a story about the relationship between the Rebbe and the Rebbetzin that shortly before Chav Beishvat, there was a, an issue with her eyes. And the Zalman Gerari took her, the Rebbetzin, to a very top specialist in Manhattan went with the taxi, and he examined the, the issue that was there, and he said there are two possible courses of treatment. Either A, which has this and this advantage, and this is the pros and the cons, and there's the other alternative of B, and which one to do, think it over, and come back to me in a couple of days and, and uh, we'll work along one of these lines. So in the taxi on the way home, Zalman asked the Rebetzin 
Mistama, obviously, you'll ask the Rebbe. You'll ask the Rebbe what to do, which of the two to choose. So the Rebbe said, he figured the Rebbe, here's the Rebbe that people, there's phone calls, there's messages, day and night coming to the Rebbe for brachas, for ages. She, she said, I don't want the Rebbe to have an Agnes Nefesh. You tell me, you think them over and advise me which of the two to do. So that the Rebbe should not have any upset. And the next day, I think it was after Mincha, whatever, he went over to the Rebbe and he told the Rebbe the whole story and asked, you know, which of these two alternatives should we do? The Rebbe said, do A. Tell her to do A, but don't tell her that you asked me because I don't want her to be upset. And this, this, uh, uh, Two ways of this of this relationship, of caring and of being, and a story I'm going to tell you in a little while, not a, not personal, but I heard it personally many times from the Balamaisa. There was a problem when you speak about the Rebetzin, you speak about a great person. And you want to pinpoint what's the greatness, we are always speaking according to our own perspective at that moment. There's something which you see as a difficult level to aspire to. It's not easy to be a person who is selfless, a person who is. Uh, um, in challenging times and in, under difficult circumstances, how they respond and how they live their lives is something which is beautiful and it tells us something, but at the same time, the more you appreciate what there is in that person, the greater the challenge to be able to apply it verse hotter to me. What can I do about this? How does this affect me in a realistic way? I'm not going to be like that. It's not, it's not human nature to be selfless. So I want to just tell a few stories, conventional stories about the Rebbetzin. But then I want to say what I think is the Nekuda of all the Nekudas. The Rebbetzin was able in every story that you hear, she was able to put herself into the other person's shoes, to relate to that person, and to turn the conversation away from herself. That was not only different levels of occupation or intellect, a, 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 a great smart person, a big rov, uh, a, a great uh, doctor, or a simple worker, which there are many stories showing how she did this, but different age groups. Uh, you take a two-year-old child. Here's a person who had no biological children, but they're at home alone the whole night. Let's think of that. And our daughter, our youngest daughter, went with my wife to, uh, to New York, to the Rebbe, for Hanukkah, Tovshin Mem Zayin. She was just under two years old. And my wife said, it was, uh, I'm doing Hanukkah in the afternoon, and um, the Rebetzin was talking to that little two-year-old, come to Doda. She was sp speaking to her and, and bringing her over, just like the Rebbe took the kid from the Brach Tagas. She had a way just exactly how to relate to a two-year-old and to draw her there with a little candy or whatever it was that she attracted her with. There was a kid who was about five or six years old. Neuer Holtzman. Holtzman, he used to, was, he was a Heusbacher there, and he, he was there with his family, with the kids, and the Rebetzin was like cutting cake for everybody. But this five-year-old kid said, I want to cut my own piece. 
he, he, give me the knife. So the Rebbetzin had to tell him it's out of the question. Now, how do you do that? How, will you, how do you do that? How do you handle a five-year-old kid? And what the Rebbetzin said was, if I give you the knife, you're going to take a tiny piece. I want to give you a big piece, so I'm going to do it for you. The way of relating to that kid, uh, you could see a child who's a bit older, uh, one of our children, our son, uh, Penny was, was there, and uh, everyone would perform or would say something, and he, he, he's a big balmanagan, he sang the Benini. And she listened, and he said that he saw a tear in her eye, that she, and he said, um, this was the fear to get up his niggin. And she said, yes, he was my father. And um, let's say a 13-year-old boy, our oldest son, Yossi, he prepared a pilpul on Shor Shenogah Chesapora, something about a Shor, and um, he said it at Suda, at, at, we had a, a get-together in Baumgarten Shul, and he said it two or three times, different moments that he actually recited, that he actually g gave over this pilpul. But he told me, just recently, we were talking about it again a few weeks ago, he said, of all the people that heard it, many, many dozens of people, maybe hundreds of people heard it over different times, there's only one person that ever asked him something about it, and that was the Rebbetzin. When they, everyone was saying something, she said, what are you going to be saying at your bar mitzvah? So he told her it's about this, and she asked questions on it. She had, knew how to take an interest to that. Well, you heard the stories from uh, Mrs. Haga, Naomi Haga, who was there, a 15-year-old, and she was there with the mother, and the Robertson was sensitive to the differences, to the, to the mother being nervous about what the daughter was eating, this, that, and, and, and reassured her. So we sat very extremely, extremely sensitive to the person that was there and how to handle that person. I know somebody who went to the Rebbeton, and they were going on, well, they were, just, they were married, and uh, they were in Koilo. And the Rebbeton said, what are you expecting to do for a living? And the person said, I hope to go on Tlichus. She said, do you realize that that is an extremely difficult thing to be able to do, to go and relate to all different kinds of people and to handle them and everything else. You know, it's a very major job. And he said, I know, and I'm, you know, she, so she said, because you're young and because you're determined, you'll be okay. She uh, was, was able to pinpoint the situation in every story. But to me, the biggest story of all is the fact of the Rebbetzin giving her very life, the uh, Reb Zalma Gerari, on a different occasion, years before, told the Rebbetzin, Eina Alein, you're alone at, at all night, to ask the Rebbe to have a self-imposed curfew. Like, he should be home, the Rebbe would go home 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, that was a night with no Yechidus. If there was Yechidus, I personally was in Yechidus more than once. After 3 o'clock, I was at least once 4 o'clock, once about 6.30 in the morning. This is the Rebbe, by Rebbe three times a week through Tov Shechav Dalit. From Chavhei, it was twice a week. Just think of the physical energy that was necessary. But the Rebbetzin was alone there. So he, told, he said to the Rebbetzin, ask the Rebbe, he should be home. We're not talking about coming home 5 o'clock in the evening. We're talking about come home by midnight, by 11 o'clock. And the Rebbetzin said, with Zahar Loshen, mention Dafinim Hob, Zolichem Apalten. People need him. 
Should I be the one that keeps him back from it? In other words, this is a, a, a manifestation of the Rebetzin's love for Kalal Yisrael. It's th this is Rebetzin saying, I'm doing this not because I'm a chassid, which she was. She's saying, I'm going to do this because you need it, because everybody needs the Rebbe. The people need the Rebbe. She was there. This was a partnership in it. Now, the story which, which to me is most significant, and I'll tell you why after I tell you. The stories are well known by now. Uh, not least, I, I've told it in many places, and I spoke with Rabbi Clapman just last night, but he phoned me about something. Rabbi Clapman is a soifer. He's a Williamsburg boy, by the way, from Raw Street. You know that. And uh, he, may, he also make, he makes candles. So he's in two major cottage industries, what they call. He's a cipher and a candle maker. And in the story figures, the rabbit talking about she as a girl seeing those two, um, those two crafts being done in, in the shtetl Lubavitch. Anyway, so one, he makes his own candles for the Shamosim. One year, it came before Hanukkah, he brought the candles to the Rebbe's house, and the Rebbe's in was there, and he gave her that. And he gave her the candles, and um, she thanked him, etc., etc. And this became an annual thing. He also offered to make, by the way, one of the big uh, yardside candles that they used to have in Lubavitch, the big ones. And but she told him he doesn't have, he shouldn't bother with it. He, he said, in Lubavitch, we did that, but over here they don't do it. Anyway. Um, Every year, he gave the candles to one of the Mesham Shem He knocked on the door, somebody entered the door, he said, these are the candles, give them to the Rebetzin. But one year, the Rebetzin called up to say thank you. She said, next year, when you come, let's plan it in advance, and I'll be there, and come with your family, and we'll have a little Hanukkah get-together. So they came the next year, and they coordinated when he's going to come with his wife and his children. And that day, when they were coming, let's say, I don't know the exact time, let's say the appointment was for 3 o'clock. And the, a, a phone call came from the Moschitas and the Rebbe Secretariat in that morning saying that the Rebbe is coming home earlier than previously indicated. He was going to come home at 5 o'clock, let's say, and now he's going to come home at 4 o'clock. And the Rebbe, in, in order for the Rebbe to come home on any day, you just heard these stories from Rabbi Mendel about how she was careful about what he's going to see when he walks into the street. That sounds perfectly typical. And she went and uh, 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 she was told, and she said she needs to prepare for the Rebbe. So she got Rabbi Gansberg, Olav Shalom, to phone them up. And he said that the Rebbe then apologizes. She will not be able to be there. Come with the children, and everything will be prepared for you. But the Rebbe then will not be present. And they came, and it was set. The table, any time I was there, there was different types of cake, according to the person that was there or the age. And there were, if there were children, they'd be candies. They'd be buttons, chocolates. And there would be, uh, and this, so he said he came there, and there was also a little dreidlach and little chocolate kind of cake, or whatever things for the children to enjoy. And Rabbi Gansberg sat with them for the half hour, whatever it was that they're supposed to be there. Then they left. And on the way home, the mother asked the children on the way home, 
Were you disappointed that you didn't see the Rebbetzin? And the oldest daughter answered, it's more important that the Rebbetzin should spend an extra minute with the Rebbe than that we should sit there with the Rebbetzin. That's what she said. The next day, the Rebbetzin phoned to apologize personally to Rabbi Klapman. And uh, she said, I'm very sorry, I wasn't there personally. She said, well, the children disappointed. So he said, I'll tell you something. My wife asked the children if they were disappointed. And the, my oldest girl said, it's more important for the Rebetzin to spend another, an extra minute with the Rebbe than for us to sit here the whole time. The Rebetzin said three words. She's my friend. That's what she said. She's my friend. And then she said, what's her name? How old is he? How old is she? What school does she go to? What grade is she in? I want to meet her. And this began a relationship, and this girl would go sometimes to deliver candles or something for this, for that. Art uh, to the extent that it came before, she was 11 years old, <coughs> when it came um, the day of her bas mitzvah, she wanted to come and get a bracha from the Rebetzin. So the Rebetzin said she should come Erev, it was in Kislev, Tavshin Memches, just a few weeks before Chav Beishva. The Rebetzin said, come uh, at, at such and such a time, and it, 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 so that she'll become bas mitzvah there. And she said, she, she said to the father, make sure, since she's going to be coming when it's light, and she's going to be leaving when it's dark, make sure that there's someone there to accompany her when she goes home, because a, a young girl shouldn't be walking in the streets alone at night. So from that they understood, this again is another typical, I know from certain personal things, with Enkamakoimam, but with the Rebetzin would make a comment which made you understand what she wanted, even if she didn't want to say it explicitly. By saying that, the Rebetzin was telling them, I want to meet her alone. No, it was the only, it was the first time that she ever went. Anytime she went, she was with one of her parents, a young child. And by saying she shouldn't have to walk home alone, they understood, they can ext extrapolate, that means that she's going to be alone until she leaves the house. And she was there alone, and the father waited outside and took her home, and they spoke, and at some stage, the Rebetzin said, it's after the Shkia, you are now a bas mitzvah, I want to give you a bracha. And the, the, uh, the girl stood up, and the Rebetzin gave her a bracha, and gave her a hug and a kiss, and uh, like, a, a, a whole big thing. This, uh, she also spoke with this girl during the talks in between about the, uh, your father makes candles. She said that there was a candle maker in Lubavitch and she as a little girl of 11 years old also used to like to go and watch how they, how they make the candles. There also was a Sefer about Sefer Torah, about, about sufferers, about scribal arts and Someone in Israel made such a sefer, a book in English, and Rabbi Glattman was the sefer that they photographed many pictures of him, and he had a copy of the book. So the girl took the book and sent it to the Rebetzin as a present. And the Rebetzin phoned up the girl and said, you know, when I was a little girl, one of my best friends was the daughter of Reb Moshe the sefer. Moshe the Sefer was in Lubavitch, and I used to go there and watch how, you know, how, how he made the Sefer Torah. She spoke with the girl, related to her. Now, to me, I, I know we all heard hundreds of stories. This is the only one that I know where the Rebetzin said, she's my friend. Those, those three words is to me. Why did she say, I don't know of any, many other people that were there, and the Rebbe said, oh, it's very nice. 
It's interesting to hear you. Very polite, very correct. I, in my opinion, my in interpretation of that story is that the Rebetzin was a person of Mesidus Nefesh. What does it mean, Mesidus Nefesh? Somebody asked me, what does it mean to be a Shaliach? What does it mean? And what if a person is earning a living, and then they might say Yodov, they're earning a living by working? How can they taste of what it means to be a Shaliach? What does it mean that all of Anasha Panasim, they call them in Israel today, it's a whole movement around the world to appreciate what you are. Somebody asked me this a couple of months ago. And I said, the way I understand it, you go to the whole Kavana in Bria Sa'olam. Why God created the world? Why am I in this world? So there's one way to look at it. I'm here to earn a good place in Ganadin. In the Sifrei Musa, to see the rays of Hashem, which is of course a spider, it's in a Mishnah. Prepare yourself for the great reward. Or there's another way of looking at life, that life is to perfect, to become an Odom HaSholem, to become a person who have, has perfected themselves as a person. And of course this is true as well. And the Rebbe instilled in the generation and taught us that the Ica, the central reason, everything of course is toides emes, emes lamitoi, but the central thing is to make a dira betachtoinim, to make this world into a dwelling place for God. What is the difference between all the other reasons and that one? All the other reasons are centered around the person themselves. Dine B'tachtoinim is what does God want? What does Hashem want? Hashem doesn't only want that I should put on tefillin or light a candle for Shabbos and get a nice place in Ganei. Hashem wants that Ploini, that somebody who you never met before should put on tefillin or should light a candle for Shabbos or should do a mitzvah. That's what Shlichus is, that's what Miftzoyim is, that's what it is. The Rebetzin's whole life was not about herself. It was not about, am I going to get the benefit from this? I'll help you get. So when this girl said, it's more important that the Rebetzin should spend another minute with the Rebbe than that we should be there, it means she was thinking of what's more important, not what am I going to enjoy more, what's going to be more pleasurable, or more meaningful, or more uh, lasting in my memory. That wasn't what it was about. It's about something beyond myself. And it, 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 so I believe that the, that's my own interpretation. That's my interpretation, that the, that the, the Rebetzin was saying, a person who looks on life as to what the Abishta wants, not what is best for me or what is going to be most desirable for me or most enjoyable for me at this moment, that is the, that is the key to everything. So you speak about a person who is that, that selfless. And, and it's on every level. But by the, the Rebbe and the Rebetzin, I heard two, two, from two people over many decades about how the Rebbe greeted the Rebetzin when he came into the house. N tonight I heard a third. And at Tzadah Shava, one was somebody who did something they should not have done. And that was that they went, to the, uh, they went and listened in the window in the house many, many years ago. And they heard that the Rebbe came into the house, and maybe the windows were open, it was summer maybe. And the Rebbe, his first words were, Hi, into Mekadrish given the Levona. There was Kiddush Levona tonight. Another person 
was our son, Bechoy Yosef, Yossi Lu, who was in the basement of Ifkin's house where my shver, Reb Zalman Jaffe and Twigga, they had an apartment there, and he was there, and he, unknowingly, it was Sukkis. And he overheard, he, after then, he never, never went into that uh, room when it was the time when the Rebbe was in Suda Shyamdev or something. But he heard that uh, the Rebbe came into the Sukkot uh, with the, uh, the Rebbe ten, and the first thing he said was, she given, go, go, a grace of There was a very big crowd in Shul. And tonight we heard from a mental fella that the Rebbe said, have gebracht the gas. And what I understand is that something pleasant, when you come into the house, when you come in, you cut, you're, you're, you're ca carrying with you all the anxieties and pressures from before and from the way and everything else, the first thing to do is to say something nice. The first thing to say when you get, come into a house to your spouse or to someone else is something positive, something I interesting. I can, I, I, I can imagine that that's what, what they did all the time. The question is, you, you hear about someone like this. It, it, it's not just a nice, pleasant story of a very f highly brilliant woman. Rabbi Zalmagarai said she, was, she had a mind like a Rebbe, like the Fiyadi Rebbe. She was quick. She was deep. She was creative. Very, very, a, a smart person. And it, it's so many things you can say. But really, she was moisten nefesh poshit begashmias. You heard that be, that she would not let the doctors come to Lafti Yechidus, and even when the doctors came, she said, "I won't let you see me until you have something to eat." You've been working all day. That was a few hours before she passed away. So how can Anoshim Sheva Akenu? How can the average person, besides really? looking up to that great example and to having full of praise and, and, and uh, recognition. But what can we do? So the Rebbe said, when he spoke about the Tzamaqtzatik ones, that the sun, the sun globe, is reflected in the ocean. You look on the ocean, you can see a reflection of the sun. You look on a river, you look on a, sw on a swimming pool, if you look at a tub of water, you'll see the reflection of the sun. You have a, 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 a pot of, uh, of water, even one single drop of water, the entire sun globe is reflected in that drop of water. It's in the Rebbe's letter of Yud Gimel Nisin Tov Shem Chavov, that the Samuel said it. That as long as that drop is pure, and it's facing the sun, it reflects it. And the Rebbe said in the same way, when you see a person whose greatness is impossible to fathom, and it's impossible to be able to uh, pretend that we ever be able to reach it, you should just know that even if you're a little drop, there's something you can do. It means be doing something because not for yourself. It means doing Mifzoyim more. It means caring about somebody else's comfort more. It means caring about what does Hashem want more than I care about what am I going to get from Hashem. So the Rebbe the Helfin, you heard about Ba'achai Litein Aliboy, L'chaim L'chaim. It should be, we should see the ultimate, the Geula, and the Bidishira, and as it says, that the point will be in the front. The Rebetzin will be in the front together with her. And it should be because of Mamish now. Chaim.